Sean Black. They used to call me the 400-pound gorilla of Oklahoma media, but today, I'm really little more than an 8-pound spider monkey. I'm the kind of guy you hate to love, and you love to hate. I often say what's on my mind, and unlike most human beings, I lack the common sense barriers between my brain and my mouth, and that, my friends, has gotten me into trouble my whole life. I was born in Seattle, Washington, during a time that was remarkably different than today. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law, there was significant economic growth, and gasoline was cheap, and Seattle was bustling with activity because of the World's Fair. There was no such thing as the internet, and the kid who invented Facebook wasn't even born yet. When people wanted to communicate, they wrote letters or even went to visit in person. A novel idea, to be sure. But let's stop for a moment. Why am I doing this project? Over the course of my life, I've made some really dumb choices, and I've made some horrible mistakes, and I've paid the price for them. While I believe I'm completely responsible for each and every one of them, I needed to know why. What caused me to be the simpleton I am today? I want my family to see where I grew up, to hear the voices and see the faces of those who knew me back in the day, and get a feel for why I am the way that I am. I wanted my kids to see some of the sights and hear some of the sounds that influenced me as a child. So this is my trip to Seattle, my trip back homeward, and they say that home is where the heart is. Well, I'm going to take a little bit of your time and examine just what is that heart of home. Tried to check into the hotel and, well, the hotel said, uh, no, I have to go at 3 o'clock or something like that. So now I'm headed over to the cemetery uh, to see mom for the first time in uh, 20 years. There we go. That's right. I remembered it, the tree behind me. Boy, I was a lot smaller back then. I had a sister who died that I never got to meet. She was just a baby. That's why it says mother of three. God, since she died. And I guess this really is the beginning of this two weeks that I plan on spending here in Seattle. This is the beginning. Don't know where it'll lead, but it's good to be back with Mom. It's been way too long. I remember the first time coming out here, it was so surreal. 14 years old, 
it's 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 unfathomable. The thought of a fourteen year old and a ten year old losing their mom. She was thirty three. It's unheard of. And coming here, I'm just the coming to Seattle, coming home, as it were, seeing Uncle Cliff, Patty. I, I still, I've got so many people still yet to see, and it's just, it's unreal. It's unreal. So much has changed, even at this cemetery. The trees are so much larger. No, no one's come out to see mom. Or, you know what I mean. She's not here. No one's come out, and. It makes me realize how incredibly fragile life is and how incredibly unfaithful I've been as a son. It's just pain that never goes away. It never goes away. I wanted my kids to see this or the family to see the place and just know that every day is a new life, every day is a new beginning. We have an opportunity to, to just love. One of these days I'll get over it. Aunt Patty asked this amazing question and as I sit here it just resonates in my mind. She said to me, she said, I know what you do. But who are you? What makes you happy? And you won't be happy until you know who you are and what will make you happy. I know it sounds like a profound grasp of the obvious, but it's true. We try to teach our kids to you know, live right, and not lie, and be honest, work hard. But it's these little moments, it's a time like now, that matter. Making things right. Making it right. I'm gonna try. This is where it begins. Went to the store and picked up some flowers. I got her favorite, the carnations. Skyway, and her and I, it was a hot summer day, <laughs> and we had the hose out there, and you and Clay and Mark were running through the water, and one of the little gals that you knew came by, and we could not resist. Your mother and I had to put the water hose down your pants, <laughs> and we laughed and had the best time. And I think that was one of my favorite moments with your mother. Tell me about, you know, your memory of, of your grandmother, what people have told you. Anything. I don't know. People haven't really told me that much. What, what have you heard? <laughs> um, well, pretty much what you said, that she was pretty emotional. Uh, she had a temper. And if she wasn't happy with you, you'd know it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've been told you look a lot alike. You you, you you have some of her physical attributes in the face. Mostly from you. I, I haven't really heard that that much, actually. Usually I just, I just hear that I look like Butch. Like Butch. <laughs> but, um. <laughs> <laughs> You're sorry you had to live with that all your life. But, yeah. Um. I 
talk about her that much. It's kind of a sensitive subject, really. Grandpa's not really a talker. Yeah. yeah. Flying it away, and you know, when they had them gallon glass jugs, yeah. and she threw that son of a bitch, <laughs> hit right at the crest of the bottom of the rear window and the trunk oh, lid, and the so. glass flew all over. <laughs> Didn't break my window, though. But then I stopped, I slammed on the brakes, and she ran back in the house and locked the door. <laughs> Oh, I remember that time Naoka got a ticket for fishing with all the Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With her stick? And didn't she have like a stick or something? She yes, and with? they took it for evidence. <laughs> Because she didn't have a license. Cliff didn't have one either. No, he didn't have one either. He, but he didn't get caught, though, did he? Yeah, both did of them got caught. Yeah, maybe they did. <laughs> yeah, they both had to go into Yakima, I remember. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's yeah, right. I tried to tell him. I asked now before we ever left town. I said, you, you want to get a license? No, I ain't going to fish. <laughs> okay. He had the pole off now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. She threw it in twice. <laughs> And here come the game warden and Clifford was doing the same thing, you know. Yeah. And here come the game warden. Oh we wasn't fishing, we just holding the pole for the kids. <laughs> yeah, right, I seen you dip it in there twice. <laughs> and run both of them. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, I guess some of the things that I don't recall, like when we got, when she first got sick, there, there was this tr period of time from when we moved from Federal Way into the city, and wasn't there some issue with misdiagnosis or? Do you no, it wasn't a misdiagnosis. Well, there was in a way uh, because she was in the Auburn Hospital. Right. Okay. And then. Uh, after they released her, they gave her a laxative yeah. and said, well, oh, let's give you a couple of days. Well, she got released on, I think it was Friday. And then she got real sick on Saturday. And I called up the surgeon I knew up at Swedish Hospital. And he said, well, bring her in Sunday and I'll meet you at my office. And then she went in and he come back later and said, well, we got to do surgery right away. The, I remember you and Nanny West and Grandma Black uh, having quite the conversation about why the hospital hadn't diagnosed properly or something, if I remember. Well, that was in Auburn. In Auburn. Yeah, they, they thought it was just that uh, her uh, intestines was plugged. Okay. Yeah. That, I remember you calling her, me. And they pumped her stomach for two or three days and then sent her home and gave her laxatives and said, well, you'll be all right. Of course, then she got real sick on Saturday. So I called the surgeon I knew up in That's the little girl. That sweet child. Uh, and took her up there on Sunday. When, she from the time that... It was two years, wasn't it? A period of about two years, because I was 12 when she got sick. No, it wasn't two years. 18 months total. Yeah. Okay, but well, yeah. roughly, right. I was 12, and then I was four, four, five, 14 when she died, then I turned 15. Yeah, because you turned 15. She went to chemo, but she only did that for about six weeks, and she caught one because she... I'd take her out for chemo on Thursday. She'd be sick. See, I don't remember Tuesday. her doing the chemo. Huh? I don't remember her doing the chemo. I just remember yeah, the well, pain. She went, I took, I'd take her out on Thursday. She'd be sick until Tuesday. Then Wednesday, yeah. she was halfway. She had to go back on Thursday. Yeah. And before we ever started, both of us sat right there and asked the doctor, says, well, now, is this chemo going to do any good? No. Oh, yeah, I think it will. I, I'm pretty sure it will. Okay. So then six weeks, and she come out, and she had not taken her t chemo treatment, she come out, and she says, I'm not doing this no more. Yeah. I said, well, it's your choice, but I says, are you sure this is what you want to do? Yeah. She said, yeah, you can go ahead and tell the doctor I ain't coming back again. Yeah. 
So I went and talked to him and I says, well, is this chemo doing her any good? Yeah. And he says, well, I don't really think so. Yeah. I said, well, you asshole. Yeah. Yeah. I said, you told her and you told me yeah. that you so felt that reasonably sure that this was going to help her. And I said, all you've done is make her sick six days out of the week. Yeah. And didn't do yes. nothing. I, I, yeah, see, my husband did the same thing. He, we found out in July, and he was gone by January for six months. But he took chemo, I think, maybe three times, and he said, that's it. I'm not doing it. No yeah. Well, do you remember that doctor over on Rainier Avenue we used to go to? You guys went to him too, yeah. I think. Um, what was his name? Oh, God. Older guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was an old guy because Jack went to him when he was a kid. Yeah. Well, but see, I the surgeon that did surgery on Nauka was the he recommended me to him. I had surgery by him. Yeah. That's how I knew who he was. You know what I'm saying? And when, Larry, Doctor Larry. Yeah, Doctor Larry. When he found out that now he had cancer, he called me up and he says, I'm closing down my practice. Yeah. And I says, what do you mean? He says, when I make a mistake like this, he says, it's time for me to quit. Yeah. And within two weeks, his whole practice was closed down and he turned it over to the front, uh, Protestant, yeah. not yeah. Protestant, now. What's the hospital down there? The Catholic? Swedish? Say, oh, Cabrini? No, the... In Seattle, the Catholic Hospital. Oh, God, I can't take that. But he turned the whole practice and everything, yeah. office building, the whole nine yards over to them. Providence. Providence. Yeah. Yeah. And he turned it all over to them. Because she had complained for years yeah. that she had back aches, back aches. And back pain. And he said, oh, no, it's just your nerves. It's just this. It's just that. And he says, when I make a mistake like this, it's time for me to quit. Yeah. And he quit. He closed down two weeks. My grandmother lived in the guy I was seven or eight years old and uh, it was the, the gathering place I remember Nanny West and her famous fried chicken and now as you can see it's been condemned it's shut down there's nothing here right over here is this is South Shore Middle School where I went to school middle school and my uncle Cliff was here and right there a truck pulled out and backed into the road here and a motorcyclist came down and he died as a result. And my uncle saw it and it freaked him out. But boy, we had some memories in this house. Emerson Elementary School. This is the route I walked home from school from Emerson every day when I went to school there. And let's see, there's Rose Street where didn't we have somebody, a family member lived here, Brenda, didn't we? That's my uh, sister's mom lives on there, Rose Street. Now the big test is if, if we can find the, <laughs> find house. the house. And I think we have found it. I think this is it. Wait. Is that it? Nope, that's not it. That's not it. Maybe it's... Is it? You remember, we? Uh, how old was I? I was little. God. Little, little. We were what, seven or eight years old. Yeah. Yeah. And right here is the house. Now, here's the story. The girl that lived in the house next door, right here, was a friend of mine, and she had to go pee. <laughs> and at the time, I didn't know that girls were manufactured differently. <laughs> So she was out here, right here in this corner, peeing. And I'm like, okay. These kids walked by, they were driving by, 
and are riding by on their bikes and went and told her mother <laughs> and there was something suspicious going on and so I got in trouble and I didn't get to play with her anymore and I didn't know what was going on but I had a BB gun and she came out on her porch her mom I had stalked her mom after that for like three or four days and she came out on that porch at the time this porch was not covered and she came out to get the paper and I was hiding right here on that porch waiting for her and as soon as she came out she bent over to get the paper and I shot her in the ass with the BB gun and uh, and boy did I get in trouble mom cut up my BB gun I didn't get to use it now across the street right here is where Queenie used to live now Queenie was a friend of my dad's from work and I remember along this fence right here used to be a white picket fence remember yeah Queenie had a son who used to tease the dog and the dog finally jumped the fence and I remember Queenie coming out of her door and beating her son's butt right there in the middle of the road because she was teasing the dog and he was not supposed to be teasing the dog. So this was the house. This is where we lived. So you're two now. I can't believe I am a grandfather. Oh, God help me. Keep going. <laughs> I think the wrapping is the present. Well, keep going. There's more. Keep going. <gasps> and you notice the Seahawk colors. Oh. <laughs> Open it up. <laughs> he got gotcha. you. That's your belly. What's up, buddy? Oh. That's your belly. Snoqualmie can pass the ski area. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta let me rehearse a little Okay, you gotta rehearse. Where are we? Snoqualmie pass ski area. Okay, now you and I went here once, didn't we? Did uh, I Did twice. I take you twice? Yeah. What do you remember twice. about it? Um, I remember falling a lot. <laughs> and, oh, I remember, um, I remember uh, Crystal taking away my poles. And I, me throwing a fit and wanting them. And then when she tried to give me back, I wouldn't take them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, a little rebellious. And the funny thing is, is, you know, you were in Colorado for a while. And this was like the big ski area. And this is like the bunny slopes in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, see, if you go up here, this is like the Black Diamond run right here if I remember correctly coming down here this was like black diamond run then over there was the bunny hill and all these chalets now I mean this is all new do you remember any of this no I don't remember any of this shit being here I remember there was just a big ass parking lot This is Matt and Butch's big adventure. Somehow I missed our turn. We're now, where are we? Toppenish. I don't even know what that means. I think it's Spanish for little town south of Yakima. I don't know. There's a lot of murals here. That's. It says it's the mural yeah. capital. Of the west. I haven't seen any yet though, have you? There was one back there. I missed it? Yeah. There's 
like some people doing stuff. Dead. On it. Well, here's a yard sale. Hi. How are you? Need some green chairs. Boy, they didn't look very happy, did they? No, I was what la last night. I was watching. I didn't watch anything. What did we do? Oh, Jesse Ventura last night. He's got a new show he's got on two TV. Oh, the oh yeah, he's exposing our government. <laughs> he's exposing everything. Oh yeah, what's that, what's that called? Conspiracies. Conspiracy, Conspiracy yeah. yeah. Yeah, What the it. hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny as shit. <laughs> oh, it's oh, 60 miles from here. Oh, jeez. They were on a fence up there. See this, this horse here? That was a, a horse I adopted out of the wild. He was a six-year-old stallion. Wow. They're Spanish horses. This one here. And I had him, I was on my 50th birthday. I was showing him at Ellensburg at the, at the rodeo grounds. And I'd been riding him about three months. And that's Lacey on him. I got so much of this shit. I'm out of some old <laughs> wood I had here. And I put her up there. <laughs> Most of this shit I just I acquired in the garbage off my garbage route. I did all this out of uh, this whole thing. This was a horse's stall. That's mine over there, that trailer and firewood and shit. I her on this medicine. She's only been only supposed to have been on it for two, three months. And she left her on it and she took her back to Virginia and left her on it for a couple of years and burned her liver up. The woman never drank a drop in her life or nothing, you know? And it burned her friggin' liver up. And so she come back out here to die. And so then my sister chased her ass back out here, you know, I was like, go back to Virginia, you know? And then she come out here and I had her up in the hospital and her arms and everything, you know, cause she fell full of water, you know, your skin does when Right. when your liver don't work. And then she went into a coma, and she was in a coma for 30 days, and she died. And then, you know, she come up here, and all she did was talk to the doctors and shit, this little Bodunk hospital, run around in her scrubs and all this crap, you know. And I made a bed in the floor, because I wasn't going to leave her. And she's running around. She's taking care of her mom, so her, hoping she'll wake up. She's talking to all the doctors and shit about how wonderful she is, you know. And so I, why don't you just pack your happy ass up and go back to Virginia? So I never did talk to her again. I think she's dead now. Nikki? Yeah. You know what? I don't care if she is. Well, I remember, you know, Dad never... Dad... I, I, first time I learned about Grandpa, about how he died, was when I came out here 10 years ago. His dad had told me for, you know, my whole life that it was cancer. And that, that killed uh, Lacey. And, uh, oh shit, he had black lung, man. Mm -hmm. From working in coal mines and right. painting houses and never, and you know, never had any protection. Well, see, I went through that same thing that he did. You know, mom died at 33 of cancer. I was told that Nanny West had died of cancer. And then, you know, grandpa, my grandpa, your great grandpa, had died of, of uh, uh, cancer from working, you know, in, in the mines. But, uh, so I was just e waiting for my 33rd birthday. Sure. Well, that's what you do, see, yeah. is you get on the run. Yep. You get on the run from all this, mm -hmm. and, and then it's like, that's why I just withdraw from it all. Because if you don't get some peace of mind for yourself, you just drive yourself nuts. And that's why I'm really strong on this turmoil and this drama and all this stuff. It don't do you no good. It's like, what for? And all this other stuff, you know, these people and all this stuff, you know what? As far as I'm concerned, when you're dead, you're dead. I've seen a lot of people dead, and I've seen a lot of people die, and I've seen a lot of people tore apart, and their legs tore off, and their guts opened up, and everything else. I've seen all that shit. I've seen people out on the highway and, and with their arms and, and wrecks and shit. And it's like, after a while, you just get kind of get, you know, we're just a human body is all we are. And that's... And then when it's gone, it's gone, you know. You can't keep wallowing in it, you know. For That's like Clay called up, you know, last night I was talking. He's all shook up, you know. 
But the point is about this guy that he's worked with for the last, you know, he worked in the shop at the school for the last few years. But the point is, the guy's 400 pounds. He didn't, he didn't care about himself. He, he just, you know, he's been on heart medicine and everything else. And he just, he got up from the chair and he fell over dead. He's had congestive heart failure. He's on LASIK. He is on all these heart meds, all this stuff, you know. And he just, he fell over dead. And he's been told for years, do something for yourself. He's 50 years old. He wouldn't do nothing for himself. Well, okay, goodbye. You know, so you got to take it all with a grain of salt. And I know you're pretty young yet, you know. But all this family stuff and all this stuff, man, it's like, you've been worrying yourself way too much. But, you know, I hope... I hope that, you know, I ain't going to cut you no slack because you need to, you need to just come to grips with it and go on. You know, you got your son and, and you know, you're getting a relationship with him and, you know, I'm still here right. and, and just take what you got, take what from it that you want and you too, you know, just take what you want from it. Mom was 19 when, when I was born. Dad was 21. Okay, so so he was two old, two years two old. Two years old. Okay, so he was two years older. I'm 60. So there was uh, five years difference. Mm -hmm. Would that be right? Yeah. Five years difference. Five years, five years difference. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she was 32 when she died, wasn't she? 33. She was 33. Yeah. So then I must have been like 28. Yeah. 27, 28, right in there. Okay. And all that shit happened so fast. And it was like, I was a mess too. I mean, you know, don't kid yourself. I was going through all of that stuff. You know, and I was a mess too. But I love my sister. I mean, I was just, her and I were just, I mean, we were tight. And, you know, just, she went to the doctor one day and, you know, she never really said nothing to nobody. And it was like, too late. I mean, you know, she was, and then it just all snowballed. The whole, everything snowballed. And, and I just, just zeroed in on that and just zeroed in on that, period. Just zeroed in on her and, and trying to help her and try to fix it. You know, just trying to fix it. And it wasn't fixable, but you know how it is when you're, when you're hanging on to something, you know. And I watched her go downhill and go downhill and go downhill and go downhill. And you know what you do? You get on hell with it. You know, forever. I mean, it's just... Till... The only thing that I resent about your grandpa is he wouldn't... When she... I took the last ride with her in the ambulance. I rode from when it was time for her to go to the hospital because she was choking to death on her own fluid. And when people die like that, they get a... It's like a rattle. It's because it's a death rattle in their lungs because the lungs fill up and they quit functioning. And and I rode an ambulance with her and stayed in room with her until she died. And that was the only thing I resented for a long, long time about it, that he should have been doing that. And he wasn't there. But you know what? I don't know where he's at, and it don't matter. Where he was at. Wherever he was at and whatever he did, he had to take that, you know, he he had to live with that. And apparently he figured it out, you know, to where he had peace with himself. So whatever it was is whatever it was. I don't know if he did, but yeah. Well see, and I don't know if I don't know if he did either. And maybe he still doesn't. Maybe there's some but Jesus, it's either you know, and I can understand it, it's either just go out and kill yourself and end it. Or go on with life, push it aside and go on with life. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's what I've always had to do is I stopped trying to figure it out, man. I mean, I just stopped it. Just she, she was, you know, stopped. she was very energetic. Very energetic. You know, just, you could, she was one of those people who, when she entered a room, you knew she was there. Yeah. Yeah, and and she was. I mean, you don't get. You know, I ain't gonna make it like she was some wonder person. She was a bit of a bitch too. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, she was. You know, and you know the other thing too is they were. That's what makes guys take notice, right? Yeah, but they were a young. <laughs> they were a young couple. I mean, they were a young couple. 
So, you know, you can only hold so much against whatever, you know, because like, I've just been there and done it, you know, and you have, and you know, you starting to, or you already have, and you know, I don't know how much more you're gonna continue, but that's up to you. But the whole thing is, is you know, how much can you really hold against a person? And what for? You know, it's, it's, all, it's all dead and gone, you know, as far as I'm concerned. I don't hold nothing against nobody. You know, all I want to do is live my life and, and try to find a little happiness, and I want everybody around me to be happy too. You know, find some kind of happiness in life. Because there's so much anger and shit, and people are, why? You know, why waste your time on all that stuff? Grab it. Because I tell you what, it can be taken from you that fast. I watched it go. I watched it. I lived for 16 months watching a person die from cancer. And it ain't pretty. I mean, it's, it's heart-wrenching. It really is. It was, it, it, it was tough. There was nothing about Watch it. a big, a, she was a tall woman, you know. Watch a tall, beautiful person just shrink into a skeleton. Just, I mean, you, you don't even know. I mean, you know, and I hope you never have to experience it. But, and to watch that, and just watch it fade away in your arm, your hands, in your arms. You know, it's just, it's just awful. It is. Well, it, it, well, it is. It's like you know, some people want, I mean, some people like to talk, and some people don't. I mean, like yeah. that. You know, my dad's side of the family. I don't know anything about anything. Oh, I sure. mean, you know, Grandpa Black. He doesn't talk. Yeah. You know, he's really, he's just an internalized person. He doesn't. You know, yeah. he doesn't talk about his family. The, I know more about his family from Vicky than I know about from him. Yeah. Um, just because he won't talk about it. He won't yeah. talk about anything. And, you know, the only thing I've really gotten from him is more of just my own intuition about, you know, how he felt about Nyoka and things. Just because yeah. he's mentioned little things over the years. Like I told you a couple of years ago, he told me he wanted to be buried next to Nyoka. Oh. It's like, well, that's a significant thing. It's like that to me logically stands out. It's like, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, you, you know, know, maybe that means like they had something. Sure, they did. Well, we sure did. I remember when they were a couple, and they were a pretty strong couple. You know, so you know who knows? Who knows? And is it really worth even condemning somebody over? You know, it's not because he's just a person. He's a, and I look at it like this. You know what? Like I've said it before, we're humans. And you know what? Humans are the most imperfect mass that was ever put on this earth. I'm sorry, we are. Think about it. And I, so how can you condemn people for, and he's probably just like that statement you just made. He's probably wallowed in this forever himself. Dad Doreen told me just the other night that Dad has been talking about uh, when they're alone when Kippy doesn't have her kids there, or it's just the two of them. He, he has been talking about mom increasingly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the whole issue, issue with the prostate and the sepsis and all that, the cancer and all that, yeah. kind of woke him up. Yeah. Here, herein lies the problem, and this is the cycle that I am stopping immediately. There, there, there has been this stopgap of information that, that, like you said, I mean, from Vicky, you've learned more about, you know, dad's side of the family than from anyone else. Well, that's bullshit. It, you and I now, Matthew, we have the opportunity to stop that, that, that breaker that exists in, in communication. You, you learn from your history, and so you don't repeat it, but you don't have to waller in it. You know, you learn who you are. This has been, this last week for me has been probably one of the toughest weeks I think in my life, sure. just learning all these sure. different things and seeing you and confessing to you all my bullshit and, and, you know, that connection again. But we can stop it. We, we can stop that pattern of, well, I mean, there's no reason. I was 33 years old, 30, when I, yeah, 34 years old before I learned that my grandfather had hung himself. I mean, that's, you know, that's bullshit. Yeah. I learned two days ago. Two days ago, that when I was a baby, I had a hole in my heart. Oh yeah, I remember that. 
No one ever told me this shit. I remember that. And, and that would have helped, you know, when I'm going through some of this medical shit that, that I'm going through now, yeah. you know. It, it, it would help. To know I remember some of that. This. I do remember that. But yeah. no one ever told me this stuff. And, I, uh, you know, how. You know, there's so much. It's like, I forgot all about that. You know, that's just yeah. another. That's just another thing along the way. And I'm sure there's a lot more. But well, you just forget things. You know, well, I don't know whether you forget it right. or there's just so much that you have to get it in perspective and you just kind of put it out of your mind. What well, I was telling Matthew is here's mind. one thing that happened, and I noticed this. Before mom died, you know, we still had this fragmentation that exists in our family. I mean, we did, you know, in a way, but but we, but mom acted in many ways as kind of a conduit for the family. You know, dad would get pissed off at his brother, <clears throat> and mom would always say, they're your family. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you got to get right, right with yeah. them. And they always bickered amongst each other. Oh, hell. They were constantly constantly. Constant. Come on now, okay, let's go. Right. I remember all that. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, and and mom would be, that. mom would say, you know, and they'd fight and stuff. But at the end of the day, mom would always say, "This is the way it's got to be." They're they're, you may want to kill them, but they're blood. And you know, dad told me the other day we're sitting there, and he says to, he was giving me shit about, you know, miss the estrangement with you and all this stuff. And I told you some of that on the way here and what happened. You know, Dad was giving me shit about it. I mean, pressing me pretty hard while I'm sitting in his living room. And I turn around, and, and, and meanwhile, he turned around the next breath and says to me, well, yeah, I saw my uncle, or your your Uncle Larry in the store about a year ago. And I'm like, really? How's he doing? I don't know. See? Yeah. And, I'm, and, yeah. and, and I wanted to say to him, and I didn't, I want to say, well, I learned from the best, didn't I? You know, yeah. you, you don't don't piss on my back and tell me it's raining. Yeah, I I didn't have that. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't know. And you and I now today, the three of us, this West Clan of what's left of us, we stop it. We stop that cycle, and it doesn't exist anymore. We stay in communication. We we, we have to because we're all the same. Yeah, well, I want that to stay in some kind of damn communication we, we have because there isn't there isn't much. I mean, you know, really. And you, you know, I really want you to just put all this to rest. Well, that's why I'm here. Uh, it was Nuki who took her back to Virginia and, uh, she was a nurse, and so that's when they first started experimenting with arthritis medicines. And they put her on, and I'll never forget it, this stuff called Clinarel. I'll never forget it. And she was only supposed to be on it for like 90 days. And she kept her on it for over a year, a year and a half, and it burned her damn liver up. And so then when she came out here, when mom got real sick, and she came out to the hospital and went to fooling around and stuff, I was pretty angry because she did it. She did it. I mean, she helped do it. So, and I was pretty angry. I had a lot of problems when, when mom died. I had a lot of problems. Because she went into a coma and I stayed up there in the hospital with her in the waiting room for 30 days. And while she was in coma, in a coma, hoping that I just knew she was gonna come out of a coma. I gotta go. I was left here with nobody. My sister died and I lived that. My brother went crazy. My mom died and my dad hung himself. And I was left here from the time I was 10 years old to fend for myself. And, and I did. I did a lot of things wrong and I did. I fend for myself and I made it to where I'm at and I'm damn proud of it. And I got a woman, I tell you what, if it wasn't for Patty, she's my rock, man. I mean, I'm serious. And it's tough to come up here because, and you know, sometimes I want to come up here and I just, man, and that's why it's hard for me to bring all this because I've closed myself out of this. You know, just lock myself away because it's hard. You know, your mom the whole time, you know, I watched her die for months and just watched her die and watched her die and the life go out of her until, you know, right, the last few gurgles in her breath. 
we're gone, you know, and it's like, I've lived with that. You got it. You've got to fight. You got to live with it. I mean, it never goes away. It just, it, it never ever goes away. It's just, I mean, it's, you know, that's why it's hard for me to, you know, that's why I talk about all these kids. I don't let nobody get real close because, because they go away. You know, it, it hurts. And I hope this time that, you know, you kind of stay in my life because you're about it, man. So, okay, I got that out. <clears throat> I'm glad I came up here. Me too. <sighs> Well, kids, what did I learn from my trek, my adventure back to my home state of Washington? I suppose I learned that family is more important than just about anything. I learned that my Uncle Larry, though he is permanently disabled, is at peace. I learned that my brother Mark has scars that will probably never heal from our childhood. Though his priorities may be off a little bit, he still has a great heart. I learned that my cousin Clay is doing well with his family and his loving life in spite of all that he's experienced. I learned that my cousin Ryan is a living example of someone with a disastrous disease who can live victoriously. I learned that my father is still wrestling with his demons, and you can see it in his eyes. I learned that at the end of the day, I'm the one responsible more than anyone for my actions. Sure, I was put through the ringer, found myself lied to more than any youngster ever should have, but really, the choices I made were mine, and I have ownership of these choices, as well as their consequences. Now, in spite of all of this, I have an amazing son, Matthew. He's intelligent, he's handsome, he's got a good head on his shoulders. And again, I say this in spite of me. I have a wonderful grandson who's a joy, and his mother, Paige, is a great mom. You know, I miss my family. I miss my mother. I miss my grandmother. I miss my cousins, both alive and dead. Look, I know that this wasn't a Spielberg production, and some of you are probably quite disappointed. But I hope that maybe, just maybe, you got a chance to see a bit of yourself see through the eyes of another what we all experience from time to time. You know, we can be surrounded by hundreds of people and still be lonely. The heart of home is the very soul of our existence. And you know what I've learned? As long as there's life, there's home and hope.